many things, a sad refrain of broken hearts that loved in vain. And if my song can start your crying eyes, I'm happy. Let me prove a low-down blues to lift you out of your sea. If my song can reach your shoes, Start you happy your feet, I'm happy. Let me sing of Dixie's charms, of cotton fields and mammy's arms. And if my song can make your home sick, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, Some of you may have heard Al Jolson music when you came into the museum today, or you may have noticed that Al Jolson table uh, when you came in. The, Al Jolson was known as the world's greatest entertainer. Jolson was an incredible supporter of our troops and performed in many, many USO shows. The International Al Jolson Society is seeking men and women who attended any of the many performances of Al Jolson during the Second World War or the Korean War. By preserving the memories of these shows, the legacy of Al Jolson, and the audience he held most dear can be preserved for future generations. Jens Reinke and members of the Al Jolson Society are here today and would be delighted if you would share your memories of Al Jolson with them. They're under the 826 and you can see a table there, their computer laptop is set up. Um, off to your right, my left, the H-26 will be underneath that aircraft. And if you do have some memories of Mr. Dolson, please stop by. Well, I don't know how many days he was there, but... I don't need, I don't recall either. So you was over in here somewhere? No, that was right. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Well, that's great. I'd imagine. Okay, that's, um, yeah. that's something else. I was just telling my son-in-law about this three or four times. Uh, what's this here? That's now? where Al Jolson Oh, yeah, for the, and the USO. And there was a kid. I was up in here somewhere. There's an empty swimming pool. I don't swimming. know if this is the same day or what. telling me about it home not too long ago. Huh. And uh, this kid was and tweeting down. And then there's a picture. He quit singing where it was. He's going to get a splinter your ass for <laughs> But then good. he turned around and that's exactly what that was Isn't it. That quite a picture? Yes. It was in September, I think it was, of 50. Uh -huh. So it was just before we made the invasion north with the Marines. Quite a, quite a picture there. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Sure like to have a copy of that. Mammy is always my favorite. <laughs> so, thanks for you know putting this on to remembering. That's great. I have one of your cards? Yes. Let's see. And that wasn't some kind of family. Yeah. It, it, uh, of course, like I say, that was back in the '40s, you know, and I was a young kid, and that's all we had. We didn't have TV then. So, uh, We'd catch him and, of course, you know, all the favorite stars back then as far as with the war and everything like that. So, yeah, very, very good. I always enjoyed him. I, I just liked his music, you know. And, yeah, I guess of all the ones I listened to during that era, he was his best. I, well, of course, there was Bob Hope, but he wasn't much of a singer. He was more
he was wonderful. He was uh, contagious. You know, he, you know, I mean, he just uh, he had a, 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 a well, what would we say, joy de vivre, the copy of the French. He just uh, he uh, he had. Uh, Charisma? It's charisma? just charisma is a good word. That's is a good that, word. That word. Yeah, that? that's a very good word. And of course, obviously, the, uh, he was a favorite of uh, the Army and Navy and uh, Marines and Coast Guard and all the people that he, he performed for. And uh, I thought he was marvelous. And I, 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 the style is infectious, really. And he had a quality of his voice. You, you, there's no doubt about it. It was him singing, you know, the, the little mannerisms he had and how excited he got. I mean, he loves singing that much. It's kind of, that's kind of why I like him. I, I, I'd, I'd rather sing than eat. What's your favorite Jolson song? You know, I, I like them all. Uh, what jumps out to you, though? Oh, uh, either... Uh, well, let's see. There's so darn many. There's, a, of course, North, nothing could be finer than be in Carolina. Uh, Suwanee, uh, 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 April Showers, of course. I think he sang that more than any, yeah, yeah. any other song. And it's a good song, and that jumps out. Uh, I Left My Love in Avalon. Did you ever hear yeah, that? Yeah, I remember that. That's, that they're speaking of Santa, Santa Catalina Island in California, and the name of the one and only town is Avalon. And that's kind of, a, and uh, to you know, yeah. to to tootsie goodbye. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in a morning where each little buttercup reaches up to greet the dawn where the morning Glories twine around each door, whispering pretty music I love to hear once more. Strolling with my sweetie in the pearly, pearly, early, early morning. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Senior moment, I can't remember the last one. <laughs> Donnan. If I had Aladdin's lamp for only a day, I'd make a wish. Now, nah, here's what I'd say. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning. <laughs> well, I don't know. You ain't heard nothing yet, you know. <laughs> Maybe to go, you know, to 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 say goodbye, you know. <laughs>
And when he sang a song, you could see he had that emotion in the song. Like when he got down on his knees and he sang Sonny Boy, people there in the theater were crying, actually crying. And he got up and he sang Ma'am Eater. Well, he sang maybe 15, 10 or 12 songs at least. He couldn't get away. The people kept clapping and clapping. How long a show, Herman, do you recall it probably being? The show? The show was probably an hour and a half, two hours. But I would say he stayed till, till about three, played an extra hour there. To the man who could sing, the man who, who brought tears in eyes, tears and laughter to people. And to many of them, remember the children and the grandchildren and all. You ain't heard nothing yeah. yet. Yeah. yeah. Anything else that you want to say, though? And I say he was probably the greatest entertainer in my, and not only in my time, and even the time. Well, I would say if he were living today, he'd be the greatest entertainer. And I'm, and I'm going with all these great entertainers from the past too. With Sinatra, Como, and all them, and I'd still say Josen was the best, and he'd be all in merrily missed, yeah. Yep. Okay. What a great guy. I think that it's important to share our thoughts about the Jolson project, which Kirk Esty and myself became involved. It was a labor of love, and it's one of these stories with no end. And I call it the real. Jolson's story. Now, why do I call it the real Jolson story? Because the more we interview the troops, the more we find out just what the troops mean and just how grateful we should be, and we can't lose sight of that. What we're looking at is the Marv Freeman Jolson Library. And as you can see, we have a few pieces of memorabilia. And we are so proud of the fact that Jolson was able to amass such an incredible volume of music to make the world sing. First of all, this gentleman, Brad Zinn, is a vital part of the Jolson project. And one thing that I have to say is that the shows that he puts on are absolutely great, but he does a tremendous amount of work for the military. So like Al Jolson, he believes in our military, he believes in a strong America, and he believes in helping the real heroes. And Jolson said he was not a hero. He didn't want to accept any medals. G-I-L. And you're keeping the memory of Jolson alive just by doing that. Uh, and Brad has raised countless thousands of dollars for the military. And for that, I thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And the Jolson Society thanks you. Thank you. Thank you. I knew Al Jolson from I was a young kid because he we're almost the same we were almost the same age at the time and we we used to see him in the movies and everything and then I saw Marv and Steve perform at our synagogue and when I was commander of the Jewish War Veterans Post I wanted to have a program and I decided bring Marv and Steve and let them do the program for us, and we have 120 members, and top coming to each meeting was no more than 35. 
If some brought their wives because they were going out afterwards, so we had 40 people, but never. That day, we had 125 people. And to this day, no one has topped me in any program that was ever presented. I was looking at them, and it's the first time I ever saw them. Everybody was up, tapping their feet, shaking back and forth. I mean, it was unbelievable. And to this day, I never put on a production that will ever match. Let's do it again. We'll do it again. Want to do it again, Steve? Do it again, yeah. Sam. Do it again. Play it again, Did Sam. You see that contract? Just about everybody in the audience knew of Al Jolson and loved and respected Al Jolson. And at one point, uh, a woman whispered in my ear, and she said, this is the first time in years that I've seen my father smile. What Bernie's saying is true. It's, it's, it's a voice that will never die. My, uh, my father and his brothers were big Jolson fans. They always talk about seeing the Yatzinger in Germany when they lived there. And my one uncle got into Jolson's dressing room in 1949 when he was doing his tour of uh, the movie theaters for the Jolson things again. So it's in the family. One of the great stories was when we, Mar Freeman and Steve Rochelle, put on a program saluting Al Jolson and celebrating the finding of the lost footage canter at the Sabbath. It was became a gala event and we had about 150 people there uh, and they all enjoyed themselves. But one of the most incredible things was that Rabbi Albert Plotkin, who had been a community leader for many, many years, was in attendance. And he told us all how he was called uh, Notre Dame's Al Jolson. One of the stories he told, you know, uh, they had a 60th reunion at Notre Dame. And when he got there, they said, are you going to do Jolson? You know, we've got you on the program. He said, well, if I get down on one knee now, and I think he was in his 80s, he said, I get down on one knee now, I'm not going to be able to get up. <laughs> but mm. uh, a lot of things impressed me about Alan. Uh, of course, his illustrious career as a broadcaster, uh, he has interviewed all kinds of outstanding stars, and he found out, as big as these stars were and are, that the biggest star of all was Al Jolson. And how did you find that out? Well, I was all of 15 years of age in Miami Beach. Now, this is going to give away my age if anybody wants to add and subtract. But this was in 1941 in Miami Beach. I was there with my father. Uh, we were living on the beach, and we were to go to a baseball game. He said, I've got a friend that I, I'm going to go to the game with, and the three of us will uh, enjoy each other's company. And it was Al Jolson. I didn't know who he was, uh, a contemporary of my father's, and apparently a very good friend. And we had a grand time at the ball game. And he didn't sing. He, he didn't talk about his career. It was just a very nice, warm time sitting up in the bleachers. And it turned out, I learned subsequently, my father had played violin. I don't know what show or shows in New York that he did and he and that Jolson starred in. And he and Jolson became apparently very good friends. I found out my sister, who's now 92 and living in Key Biscayne, Florida, uh, my sister Peggy uh, met him. She said she thinks she was maybe 9 or 10 when my dad uh, uh, 
introduced him, and I never saw him perform Jolson live until 1946, Miami Beach. I went to work for the first radio station, first time on the air, WINZ in Miami Beach, and they had an all-star night of performers at one of the theaters on Lincoln Road at the beach, and Danny Kay, Al Jolson, there were a number of stars, and I am there with a tape recorder for the radio station, sitting right below the lip of the stage, looking up in awe at these performers. Danny Kay blew me away. Al Jolson came out and I fell over. He was just unbelievable. And to be that close to him and watch him, that was the only time that I saw him perform live or in person. Yeah. So I read uh, in a book that someone had interviewed Al Jolson and the question was something similar to Al, how do you want to be remembered or how do you want to be thought of? And it was his answer that stunned me. He said, I want to be thought of as a great comedian. And I stopped, literally. And that took minutes for me to absorb that because it was so uh, revealing about how Jolson felt about himself. And so diametrically opposite probably to what other people thought of Jolson. He really considered himself a comedian. And that's what he wanted to be thought of. Now, obviously, he was a member of the Hillcrest Country Club, and they had the Friday lunch roundtable, and that was with all the great comedians, Groucho and Danny Kaye and George Burns and Jack Benny, and, and all of them gathered for lunch, and Jolson was very much a part of that group. And so he, uh, he traded quips and jokes with these other comedians and felt that he was right at home with them. So this gave me a great insight into how Jolson thought and, and performed and thought of himself. And so I think anybody that overlooks that is missing a big part of who Jolson really is. And that's why I consider him one of the great comedians of the 20th century, because certainly that's how he thought of himself. Uh, a few years ago, when I did two radio shows, uh, Jolson Lives and Jolson Lives Again, what started out as being a tribute to Jolson became a tribute to the troops because there was no stronger love affair than his concern for his kids. And when he was in Korea, the first major performer to come to Korea and the first performer to have a transatlantic broadcast pleading with entertainers to come and help the boys in this hellhole. He uh, was just awestruck by just what kind of Americans we had representing us and he was first and foremost a patriot. But the greatest honor that he felt was that when he, as GIL, entertained the troops and wouldn't accept any kind of commission, he was one of the troops. And so when uh, the veterans organizations referred to him as a veteran, that's exactly what he was. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. One leaf is sunshine, the second is rain. Third is the roses that grow in the lane. No need explaining, the one remaining is someone that I adore. I'm looking over a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before.